Standing, am I on own? Yeah. Standing near a grave where Martha was grieving the death of her brother Lazarus. The Gospel writer John, the beloved disciple, records these words of Jesus for us. Where Jesus says to Martha, to everyone sitting around, grieving that loss. He speaks these words of hope. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you 
believe this. Jesus asked that question of Martha that day. It's a question that I think he continues to ask in churches all over the globe. Do you believe this? Hugh grew up attending his local church in Scotland. It just feels like a Scottish day, doesn't it? Cold, wet. I was going to say miserable. I don't want to offend any of the Scots in the room. Ugh. Just feels like we're in Scotland, doesn't it? It was never like this in Ireland, I can trust you, trust me. Growing up in Scotland, Hugh would have been part of a Sunday school, would have been going to Boys Brigade, and he would have been taught from a very young age that God so loved the world that he gave his own only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal, everlasting, abundant, overflowing life. I have no doubt that Hugh was a lifelong man of faith. He believed Jesus is the resurrection and the life, life beyond our imaginings. And that's why we have gathered here today to not merely remember Hugh's life, but in thanksgiving, commit him into the care of his resurrected Savior. So on behalf of Jesse, Janice, and Stuart, may I thank you for joining in this service of worship and praise. Of course, we should have been doing this service last year. Today marks the one-year anniversary of Hugh's death. COVID-19 has disrupted our way of life in ways too numerous to mention. But one consequence of, of the pandemic that none of us saw coming was that our society would lock down. We would close our doors. We would stay inside. And for so many months, we've been forced to learn a new term, live by it. Physical distancing, social distancing. And so we didn't get an opportunity to gather around you, Jesse, one year ago today. Jesse, despite our distance, a year ago, your church family, your friends have been thinking about you and praying for you then and throughout this year. We hope that today will be a blessing to you. The ongoing pandemic is still disrupting gatherings. And so today, some are gathered here in this place. And some are gathered online by a, a little video link. Some will watch this later, the recording of this service online by YouTube. Zoom is not how some of you online or any of us want to participate in a service like this. But it is a blessing nonetheless that we can gather in our worship spaces, wherever that may be, here or perhaps even in Scotland. So on behalf of everyone today, I'm going to light a candle. We've been doing this in our church services since the start of this pandemic. A candle to remind us that we are in the presence of our Lord Jesus, who is the light of the world. We are gathered around him because of him. And it seems appropriate to remind ourselves of that today as we remember Hugh's life. Growing up in the Church of Scotland, he not only would have been taught John 3.16, but the 23rd Psalm. And in it we read these words, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. No matter what valley, we must all walk through on our journeys of life. God is with us. He's with us today. He's been with Jesse and the family this past year or more. So as we gather, let's come before our Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather this afternoon as family, as friends, sorrowful that we were not able to do this a year ago that we were not able to gather around Jesse to 
support, comfort, bless her. We come today to remember, to, to remember Hugh's life, to give thanks for that life, to give you thanks for his faith in you, and to commit him to your eternal care. You, God, spoke into the darkness in the beginning. And into that darkness and nothingness, you created light and life. So we ask you to speak words of life today. We ask you to spread your light once again into these dark days. Where so many, like Jesse, have endured a death of a loved one with little, if any, social contact. Your servant of God, King David, prayed that whatever valley he had to walk through in life, he knew that you would always be with him, that you would never leave nor forsake him. So we claim that promise, that proclamation, that belief, that faith right now. We acknowledge today that in the midst of our gathering, you're here. And when we couldn't gather a year ago, you gathered around Hugh and Jesse to support and bless them. Despite the circumstances that were outside of our control, we trust that you were indeed holding on to Hugh's hand every second. Father God, we thank you today for the memories that we will share as part of this service and memories we will share beyond this service. Help us to remember those memories. Meet with us. Bless us here in this place. Spirit of the living God, we ask that you would speak to all here today, those online, those that will watch this later, the words that only you can speak, the words that we need to hear, the words that Jesse needs to hear words of blessing and hope and healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, growing up in the Church of Scotland and the Boys Brigade, um, when Jesse and I were talking about the service today, there was one obvious hymn that we had to kind of begin the service with. So I'm going to invite you, if you're able, to stand, and we're going to sing a couple of verses, the first and last of a good old tune uh, from back home, as I would say, Onward Christian Soldiers. The words will be on the screen and shared with you uh, online for those of you online.
wasn't in the Boys Brigade in Northern Ireland, but I was in the Robins. Don't actually know why they called it the Robins, probably because of the red jumpers they forced us to wear when we were like knee-high to grasshoppers. I remember singing that song as a little boy uh, going to Sunday school in Boys Brigade. Uh, We're going to hear from a few folks now uh, remembering Hugh's life, and so I'll kind of introduce them in turn. But we're going to start with um, uh, daughter and uh, sons. We're going to ask Janice and then Stuart to come up and share some memories uh, to begin with today. Thank you. Hello, I'm Janice. I believe most of you know me. I'm the daughter formerly known as Janice McCready. Uh, Hugh's my father. It's lovely to see you all here. Thank you for coming. As my father would have said, I appreciate your support, and I shall think of you every time I wear it. When my mother asked me to speak for a few minutes today, I was honored. I told her that I could speak for longer than that, and she replied that she was well aware of that fact, which is why she's specified the limitation. I must tell you that the last eulogy I wrote was for a Siamese fighting fish. He was the fish at my daughter's daycare. I'm hoping this will be a little more dignified than a toilet side service for a fish, but really you can't count on that. (laughs) My father has a lot to answer for. Y'all don't think I got like this on my own, do you? The man was brilliant and a maniac. He loved words and any sort of wordplay. He's the main reason that I started believing that I could write. He loved changing words by putting the accent on the wrong syllable. I'm not entirely sure that the islands in the north of Scotland are not in fact called the Hebrides. And to this day, I still try to convince people that Pine Tree Way in Coquitlam is pronounced Penetri. He was always proud of my writing. I, I wrote a poem one day and he asked me to fax it to his office. He called me all excited and asked me if I'd written it myself for real. I said yes. He asked me if he could show it to everyone in the office, and I said yes. It was a poem about a cat who had to go to the vet for what Dad referred to as the unkindest cut of all. The poem was entitled To Max Upon the Sad Occasion of His Orchidectomy. So yeah, he was okay with me being weird. He had an amazing ear for accents, which of course was reflected in his musical talent. He could say, oh, oh yes, they were born in Leith, on Smith Street, the left side of the road, about halfway down, and they're Protestant. I'm just like, you can tell that from eight words, but he could. Um, He also loved really, really bad jokes. His favorite one was, my little dog has no nose. Really? Really? How does he smell? Terrible. Anyway, uh, my father was a fighter. He faced a number of health issues over the year peritonitis, tuberculosis, colon cancer. He was told 22 years ago that he had five years to live. That seemed like nonsense, so he just kept on living, and I'm glad he did. He saved my life once. We were on a train in Scotland. I was, what, four or five, and Mum gave me a pan drop, and I breathed in and got it stuck in my air pipe. Dad grabbed me by the ankles, shook me up and down while my mother whacked on me like I was a pinata or something. It worked. Dad was relieved. I think Mum just sort of liked hitting me. Um, (laughs) But at the end of the day, what he was, most of all, he was my dad, and I miss him. Thank you. Okay, now it's my turn. I'm Stuart. Um, I am my father's son, and I want to speak of some of the things that I learned from him. I learned patience. I learned when to listen, when to speak, how to understand, and when not to speak at all. I learned perseverance. When I was young, learning how to ride a bike, he would run behind me in Trimble Park and let me go and I would fall down, and then he would try it again, and again, and again, and finally he let go one day, and I didn't realize he had let go, and I knew how to ride a bike. He also gave me perspective. Um, All of us have been through many changes over the years, and he taught me 
how to step back and look at myself and look at others before we're stepping back into the situation and figuring out what to do. All those things are me and all those things were him. I am my father's son. Thank you to Janice and to Stuart. Um, when I met Stuart for the first time in the office, there was just a couple of moments when he would do something, say something, and it was like Hugh was right there. So definitely your dad did not only teach you things, you are got a lot of him in you. So thank you to both of you for sharing your memories with us. I know Laurel and Colin are here because uh, Steve and I were standing out the front. We saw two people arrive. One of them was a brave soul that was wearing a kilt. And so it had, it had to be him. So we, are you, Laurel? Yes, so that's great. We can now invite uh, Laurel and Colin Guernsey who danced with uh, Jesse and Hugh. Uh, I think they're gonna come up and actually teach us a liturgical dance right now. So over to you guys. Who is Hugh? You notice I'm using the present tense for this wonderful man because he's all around us in the faces of people who meant so much to him. Colin and I met Hugh and Jesse when our friends the Sutherlands thought it would be fun to take Scottish country dancing lessons. Both Colin and I have Celtic backgrounds, so we were all in. And for 12 years, we had the chance to listen to Jesse shouting, Wished when we misbehaved and giggled at our mistakes, and there were a lot of mistakes. Hugh, with a twinkle in his eye, stood by and just grinned. He had such a lovely, quiet grin and a wry, dry sense of humor to match. He was always there beside Jesse to demonstrate how a step was supposed to look, how a petronella or a part of the eightsome worked. Pure elegance, his back straight, his steps perfect to match Jesse's, a perfect dancing couple, a perfect couple. We picked Hugh and Jesse up for their 50th wedding anniversary and then their 60th wedding anniversary and drove them in Colin's Lagonda to the celebrations. And at, at those celebrations, Hugh was still very much the elegant dancing partner, still obviously very much in love with Jesse. After the balls and the dancing ended, we continued what had become a wonderful friendship with Jesse and Hugh and would meet them for lunch at the 80s restaurant and share stories. And, favorite television programs and books. And about books, Colin's going to talk about that. I met Hugh about 35 years ago. It's, it's, it doesn't seem that long ago now when you think about it. it the years just sort of went by and we, we shared a number of interests. For instance, um, we worked with the same people uh, in the forest industry. Uh, I was in the north. He was in the south, but the same people seemed to move around. And we, we shared some interest in that. But especially we shared an interest in history, and I, I, I think Scottish history in particular. And one of my favorite authors, which I shared with uh, Hugh, was Nigel Tranter. I don't know if anybody's read him, but um, his imagination and research endeavored to bring the history of Scotland to vivid life, and he wrote books, I think a trilogy about the Bruce, and he wrote the, about the Black Douglas and the Montrose and um, the Lord of the Isles, and, and in reading, I guess there there's must be well over 20 novels that I've got at home, and reading those through seemed to bring the, the, the islands and, and this whole Scottish uh, area to life to me. And I remember Mark remarking to Hugh about how in Tranter's de depiction of all the Scots lords seem to love to fight with each other, uh, to stab each other in the back, and et cetera, et cetera. And he thought for a moment and sagely nodded his head, commenting that it still seems to be a trait of the Scots today. Um, he also Hugh also had an inquiring mind. For instance, Hugh lent me a book titled The Boys about a thousand boys under 15 who were Holocaust survivors. 
and had been in concentration camps who were taken to the Lakes Districts in the UK to be rehabilitated about how to live in polite society. Uh, the book followed them through their lives into old age. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, is that it demonstrates Hugh's deep interest in a whole variety of things, not just the historical, but the presence and his, his uh, thoughts about, I think, mankind and society in general. Anyway, reflecting on my Scottish genes and, and my great-great-grandfather, William Burns, I think it would be appropriate to paraphrase Robbie Burns. And I'm going to end with saying that Hugh's heart is in the highlands, his heart is not here, his heart's in the highlands are chasing the deer. Chasing the wild deer and following the roe, Hugh's heart is in the highlands, and in time, we'll find him there. Thanks to Laurel and Colin. Uh, I knew that uh, you guys had arrived, obviously, and so I said to Jesse, I, yep, they're here. Uh, but I'm not too sure if Claude's here. And uh, I said, Jesse, can you describe him? She said, tall, dark, and handsome. I thought I was the only one that was tall, dark, and handsome here in this church, but then I realized I'm not dark, so <laughs> it's not me she was referring to. So there's somebody in our congregation right now who is tall, dark, and handsome. His name is Claude Gaguerre, and he's the leader of the Celtic Fiddles, and I'm going to invite him to come and speak to us. Thank you. This was a very uh, entertaining presentation. And uh, when I heard Janice talk about Hugh and his jokes and about the accents, of course, uh, he laughed a lot about my accent and uh, a lot about, uh, yeah, we laughed a lot because, I mean, he had so many jokes in his pockets, so many things that he, uh, he when you say he played with words and stuff, it's to me, it's, you know, I remember him very vividly. Um, so I'm Claude, Claude Giguere, and I am um, the uh, director of the North Shore Celtic Ensemble. And so we work with youth, and um, so the ensemble, what we, uh, one of the roles we have is to try to bring together uh, youth and senior members of the community. And for that reason, we ended up uh, at the Silver Harbor Center many, many, many times playing concerts. And this is where I met um, Hugh and Jesse. Um, every time we played, they were there. And uh, every time we played, Hugh came at the end of a performance and spoke with us and uh, had a vivid interest um, with what we did and uh, had comments to make about how we did it. And then. He always had opinions about things, and he was, you could tell he was very, very passionate about music. And um, so we had, my, my impression over the times we went uh, to Silver Harbor is I had, I met someone, and Jesse is the same, very open people, very warm, very engaging, very interested, and, um, because of that, I think we became very f close and friends, and we, um, we got together and did talk about music because Hugh loved to talk about music. He could talk about music all day, and, uh, which we did a lot. And then out of the, all those conversations, we, um, we thought we would maybe work together and do this big, crazy collaborations between uh, the North Shore Celtic Ensemble and members of the Silver Harbor uh, Center. So we, uh, you, Hugh, as you know, was the director of the choir there. So he had a big, he did for five years, he worked with the choir at Silver Harbor. And both of them were involved in the Scottish country dance. Um, they were teaching that there. And um, so uh, I was amazed how invested they were in the uh, cultural life of all the people at Silver Harbor and the community in general because also they were, I don't know if you've heard them duetting the two of them together, uh, him playing the guitar and Jesse singing and both of them singing actually and it was it's just a 
beautiful energy coming of both of them and uh, that engagement that I felt right off the bat is, is, uh, is always there. So we, we planned this big show and we called this um, um, spirit, oh, ageless spirit, there you go. Um, and we produced it and we put it at k -Meek. We did a big show at k -Meek Center and then we went to the Centennial and did it also at the Centennial Theater. And this was really well received and you know when you work something like that, um, it gets pretty intense. And so I got to know Hugh pretty well. And, um, and um, Stuart, you were talking about hard work and um, I, you know, he was so uh, so demanding, and I had high standards of how to do things, and so we worked hard. We worked a lot, we practiced a lot, and it had to be perfect. And even in those moods where things, the intensity is quite high, he always knew how to make a joke and just lighten up the, the mood, right? He, was, he would just come with something and then, you know, everybody would laugh and then, it, you know, all the tension would dissipate really quickly. So he had, he really had a way uh, with with directing, and um, yeah, just working hard, and yet keeping always a good balance of of uh, intensity and lightness at the same time. Um, I miss Hugh, and um, when it's very quiet, sometimes I think of Hugh, and I I can hear his laugh. And I, I can hear his music, and I, I can see his, uh, his smiling face. Oh, this one. <laughs> and it's probably what he's doing right now. So, thank you. Thanks, Jess. One of the songs, I'm sure, who first learned as a boy in the Church of Scotland and the Voice Brigade. I'm going to invite you to stand. Now I'm going to sing it together. Jesus bids us shine. A couple of scripture readings uh, now. The first uh, is from Jessie. She's going to come and read her favorite psalm of all of them, uh, Psalm 121. And then we're going to have uh, Jamie Anderson read, who I knew, I know, uh, used to probably love speaking to Hugh and Jessie. So Jamie's going to come and actually share some verses from Revelation chapter 19. So, Jessie. Having heard so many 
people say so many nice things about Hugh. I didn't realize he was that nice. <laughs> anyway, where I live now, I'm surrounded by beautiful mountains, and they are a, a comfort to me. My favorite psalm is Psalm 121, and I'm sure many of you will know it. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. The second reading for today is from Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 to 16, and I'll be reading from the message. I heard a sound like massed choirs in heaven singing, Hallelujah! The salvation and glory and power are God's. His judgments true, his judgments just. He judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her lust. He avenged on her the blood of his servants. Then more singing, hallelujah. The smoke from her burning billows up to high heaven forever and ever and ever. The 24 elders and four animals fell to their knees and worshiped God on his throne, praising, amen, yes, and hallelujah. From the throne came a shout, a command, Praise our God, all you his servants, all you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard the sound of massed choirs, the sound of mighty rapids, and the sound of strong thunder. Hallelujah, the master reigns, our God, the sovereign strong. Let us celebrate, let us rejoice, and let us give him the glory. The marriage of the Lamb has come, his wife has made herself ready. She was given a bridal gown of bright and shining linen. The linen is the righteousness of the saints. The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. He added, these are the true words of God. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he wouldn't let me. Don't do that, he said. I'm a servant just like you, and like your brothers and sisters who hold to the witness of Jesus. The witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open wide, and oh, a white horse and its rider, the rider named Faithful and True, judges and makes war in pure righteousness. His eyes are a blaze of fire, on his head many crowns. He has a name inscribed that's known only to himself. He is dressed in a robe soaked with blood, and he is addressed as word of God. The armies of heaven mounted on white horses and dressed in dazzling white linen follow him. A sharp sword comes out of his mouth so that he can subdue the nations, then rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the raging wrath of God, the sovereign strong. On his robe and thigh is written, King of kings, Lord of lords. This is the word of the Lord. Well, 
what are your memories of Hugh? Sit down and have a wee natter with Jessie someday, and she will tell you many memories, many stories, many fun occasions with Hugh. Laughter, as we've already heard today, played such a huge part in Hugh's Hugh's life, in their married life. Hugh loved to laugh. Jesse has 63 years of love and laughter to share with you about Hugh. One story she shared with me. On the Valentine's Day, just before they got married, Hugh sent Jesse a card with a verse in it. It read, Roses are red, violets are blue. God made me handsome. What happened to you? (laughs) He's a brave man. I think that's why he left Scotland and came to Canada. Hugh loved a good laugh. I remember the fun he used to have with his walking stick and that little bell on it. Despite getting frailer, despite his voice getting softer, weaker, his joy of life was always there at the door at the back of this church, Sunday after Sunday. Hugh loved life. He loved to dance, to sing, to drum. We drummers must stick together. He loved groups coming together to share life together in music and song. I was so struck by a photograph of Hugh taken in 2004 that Owen is going to share for us and keep up on the screen. Hugh leading the Silver Harbor Choir. The caption in the North Shore News describing this photo was, quote, Choir leader Hugh McCready looks like he's preaching the the gospel of good time singing to the Silver Harbor. Harbor Choir. The gospel, the good news, that's what the word means. The life-giving news of good times singing. Hugh loved to sing, to dance, to play, to laugh. He loved life. What are your memories of Hugh McCready? Born in Glasgow, Scotland, Hugh was a chartered accountant. He was very involved in the Boys Brigade and was a leading drummer with the Kinning Park Pipe Band, who won the Junior World Championship in 1954. He married Jessie Burnett on August 9, 1958, and had two children, Janice and Stuart. The family moved to Canada in 1968. Hugh and Jessie taught Scottish country dancing for 43 years in BC and Ontario, and were both folk singers traveling for many years. Hugh led the 50 Boys Silver Harbour Choir for five years and also taught Sudoku there. Jesse and Hugh had a great life together for 63 years and had many, many good friends. What are your memories of Hugh? One year on after Hugh's death, memories are what we are left with. No new memories will be created. No new stories of love and laughter. No new jokes. Because Hugh's life apparently came to an end one year ago today. Starting this service today, I quoted Jesus' words saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone believes, who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asks. He asks. How can any of us, including Hugh, believe such an audacious claim? How can any sane person respond to someone's death with a proclamation of life? Jessie read from her favorite psalm, which concludes with this. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. 
Okay, I think we could all accept that. The Lord will watch over us during our life here on earth. But what do we do with the very next verse, the last verse? The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. More literally, your coming and your going really means your birth, life, death. The Lord will watch over all of it now and forevermore. How, how can that be true? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That's the start of the biblical story in the book of Genesis. It's a picture of darkness, which really is a symbol that all of us could so easily equate to death. See, in the beginning, the biblical story starts with nothing, nothingness lifelessness. But out of the darkness, into the darkness, God creates light and life. Chapter 2, verse 7, he says, the Lord God himself uh, formed a human being from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of his own life, and he became a living being. God breathes into the dust, into the darkness, into the death, and creates life. In the beginning, God transformed death to life. But unfortunately, for those of you who have went to Sunday school, you know the story. Very quickly, humanity ends up doing something they were told not to. And as a result... What God tells them will happen does. They will surely die. They will lose life. By the end of chapter 3 of the very first book of the Bible, a story that began with darkness and hopelessness that then is transformed into life apparently returns back to its roots, to the, to the, the scene of darkness and death, hopelessness, despair. It appears that the story of the world, you and me, has only one possible ending. Hopelessness, graves for all people. But when you turn to the very last page, the last chapter of the Bible, just after the reading that Jamie read just there for us, we're told these words. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every single month. And the leaves of that tree are for the healing and life of the nation. The end of the story, the end of the Bible is not a picture of death after all. It's not emptiness and hopelessness. It's not a grave. It's a tree bearing fruit, feeding people. It's a picture of life. How, how on earth did that happen? How do we get from this scene of darkness to this incredible scene of life? Because in the middle of humanity's grand story that we could call the Bible, there's a story about a garden. But in fact, when the garden is first introduced to us, it's actually a graveyard. It's a cemetery. This place is shrouded in death because in it lies the body of one man. On a dreadful Friday afternoon, this man was crucified. He died and was laid in a grave, in a tomb, in a cemetery. For his disciples, his family, his friends, 
that Friday ended in a picture of people gathered mourning a death, grieving their loss. And they were pretty lacking in hope. But early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, a symbol of death was over all of it, we're told that Mary Magdalene went to this tomb, this graveyard, and she saw something she wasn't expecting. The stone that was covering the entrance to the tomb had been rolled away, removed. And into the darkness, words of creation were spoken. Angelic figures looked her square in the eye and said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. A grave had been transformed into a garden right there. Hopelessness replaced with hope. Grief and sorrow had become abundant joy. One year ago today, Hugh Ingram McCready, his life with us, among us, with Jesse, ended. And we and she is saddened at that loss. But Hugh's life is not over. We are gathered today at this service we call a memorial service because we want to and we rightly should remember Hugh's life. You've heard memories rem remembering Hugh today. We want to honor his life. But this service is far more than merely about remembering because we can gather in this place and celebrate a proclamation that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Hugh's life, is not over. When we were picking songs for today, I wanted to choose something with Jesse that I thought would remind us of the beginning of Hugh's life. So we sang, Jesus Bids Us Shine. As I think the song reminds me of Hugh because he did indeed shine. He was a light shining and singing and dancing and drumming. I think Hugh conducted his life, his choirs, encouraging others to shine dance and sing and play, to be full of life and laughter and joy. Hugh's love of singing is what drew me to that second reading that you heard Jamie read from the book of Revelation. It comes right at the end of the biblical story. Did you hear what we were being told was happening at the end of the story? It's not the sound of sorrow and sadness. It's not the sound of silence. Revelation chapter 19 is really a Cayley. It's a mass choir gathered singing. There's a huge orchestra, and they are playing every single instrument imaginable. Drum kits upon drum kits. People dancing, rejoicing, full of life. Because what lies beyond our lives here is not hopelessness nothingness, lifelessness, but abundance, renewed, redeemed, restored, saved, life. Jesse, my heart goes out to you because your beloved partner of 63 years is no longer with you, is no longer able to sit with you and look out of those mountains that I know you absolutely treasure. But Jesse, Hugh hasn't stopped dancing or drumming. In fact, perhaps right now, if you listen hard enough, you might hear him conducting the largest choir ever, as together they preach the good news of good time singing. Let's pray together. Almighty and gracious God, your love is just so abundant. We can't describe it. But we can invite it. 
and ask for it to surround us and uphold us and bless us in times of difficulty, in times of trouble, in times of despair and doubt and grieving and sorrow. So we ask that your love would uphold everyone who knew and loved you, but especially Jesse. You know, Lord, what it is to lose a part of yourself. You sent your son, our Lord Jesus, into the world to dwell with us and die for us. You know. So help us to hold on to you this day, one year on, as we say goodbye to a dearly beloved you. Thank you for the memories that we have and that we can cherish of you. Thank you for his fond, loving spirit, his life of laughter and joy, his enthusiasm for singing, spreading hope and light and life to so many. Thank you for his love, primarily with his beloved Jesse. Today's not the last day we will reflect and remember. But today, we get an opportunity to be here, O oh God, and give you thanks for Hugh's lifelong faith in you, for growing up in the Church of Scotland, the Boys' Brigade, and being taught the stories and believing that you are his Savior. Thank you for his faith the assurance of that faith, the assurance that was proclaimed once by the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the Romans, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These words, once spoken by an apostle, these words assure us even today that you have prepared, O oh God, a room in your house for Hugh McCready, and that nothing will ever separate Hugh from your love ever again. With that assurance into your hands, we commit Hugh this day forevermore. Lord Jesus, you have walked the path of grief with others before today. Comfort this family that are gathered, the friends here, near and far. Pray your blessing over Jesse and Janice and Stuart, everyone gathered here. But this past year has been a long year for so many, particularly Jesse. So Lord bless her, surround her, pour out upon her and her family the peace that passes all understanding. Spirit of the living God, reassure them today that they and their beloved Hugh are always and forever held in your care and your protection. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. We're going to conclude our service today standing and singing three verses of a wonderful hymn of praise, How Great thy art. If you're able, please stand.
behalf of Jesse and the family just say a word of thanks to Lori, good friend from Coquitlam Presbyterian who has come to lead our worship today. Uh, you can stay standing, I'm not going to speak too long. And uh, just to let you know that we've got some tea and coffee and cookies in the hall. Uh, right after I'm going to bring Jesse and the family out uh, if they want to actually greet you. But because of COVID restrictions, we have to see your vaccine passports in order to get into the hall. So I hope that is not a problem for anyone. Steve, our custodian, will be at the door to double check. Um, please um, I, I beg your I, you know, indulgence with that, but uh, that we're trying to follow the rules as best we possibly can. Um, but um, thank you for coming today. Thank you for blessing the family. And I'm sure they would love to actually speak to you for a little bit in the hall. So please don't rush off too quickly after service. I invite you to stand and receive uh, the benediction as we close today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and fill each and every one of you this day with his peace, his blessing, his life, now and always. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.